entirety of the Super Smash Brothers community. This is Beyond the Metagame. I'm your host, Peon, this week live from Corneria. And I'm joined, as always, by my wonderful co-host, A.V. A.V., how you doing, big guy? You know what my favorite thing to do as a kid was? So in Melee, when you, on, on Corneria, you know the, the laser at the bottom? Oh, yeah, the bottom, bottom left? Stage? Yeah, of course. Yeah, just, just everyone going to that laser and fighting around that, and then just, like, waiting for you know, everyone to be inevitably, like, just, like, <laughs> annihilated. That was honestly one of the most fun, fun times I've had. That map, Smash. dude, freshman year of college, when I was first getting into Smash, um, I had, I played a Falco, and I was trash, but I was I was still the best person on my floor by far, because we had a little GameCube like in our in our communal lounge, and there was this kid named Phil who had who had fight, and I would just forward smash him endlessly on the bottom right kind of platform on Corneria, and he'd be sure. like, oh, he, he was a Rager, he's like, oh, this is Sea Stick Cove over here, <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <And> for, <stupid. laughs> forever. When that stage comes back in Ultimate, I'll think of that area of Corneria as Sea Stick Cove. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I think I think I will now too. Um, <laughs> I think we should get into what we're doing today, and today's going to be a very very special episode. We have an interview with SSB Pro Tips. Yes, his tag is Lada. He's a man of many names, but you probably know him as SSB Pro Tips. Uh, this guy has a pop and Twitter account, right? He he is so good at finding nuanced examples. Of, of play that differentiates the really good players from the you know good players. You know he really understands uh, those cherries on top of the Sunday that really elevate someone's play, and, and and he communicates it in a way that's really digestible and easily uh, implementable into your own gameplay. If that is a word, yeah, my, I think it's a word. Uh, in any case, before we dive into to the outline of what we're going to get into today, why don't you tell us? what uh where our viewers have been from recently yes 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 yes. okay so i'm excited about this one uh recently we got viewers from both france and the united kingdom you know uh, arch rivals historically but i've been to both those countries and they're both beautiful and you know thank you for listening to the, from those countries we appreciate you and and those uh listening from any country uh, we appreciate you and welcome uh to the team uk and france yeah, definitely. So today, what we're going to get into with our friend SSB Pro Tips is we're going to kind of talk about his mission, uh, talk about how he got into moving people from this, from being a good player to being a great player, talk about bridging the gap. What is this gap? How can we define it? How can we contextualize it? And how can we cross it, most importantly? And with uh, crossing this gap, how do we take information from resources like SSB Pro Tips and mentors in our community and how do we implement the stuff to our gameplay and if, and eventually how do we cross pitfalls that kind of hurt us on this journey hurt us on this path to greatness so we interview SSB Pro Tips in just one second <music> Welcome back to Beyond the Metagame. This week, AV and I are joined by the illustrious. <laughs> you might know him as S SSB Pro Tips. Uh, we know him as Lade, formerly Red Halbert, a brawl veteran, a Smash 4 uh, knowledge powerhouse. You might have seen his tweets. Thank I you, sure have. <laughs> and we're glad to have him on. So, yeah, uh, Lade, a lot of people know your your Twitch, or not Twitch, rather, your uh, Twitter account. You know, it's, it's really blown up. Um, be because you really do provide insight that nobody else is providing. You, know, you look at these little micro instances of of nuanced uh, decision making and this really excellent play that could uh, could easily be overlooked. And that's why I I became a fan of your Twitter account and was like, wow, this guy this guy's got a lot to say. Um, so yeah, could you like give us your background and and how you got to the point where you were uh, able to both uh, notice and articulate these like really high level gameplay moments. Okay, absolutely. So um yeah, hey guys, I'm I'm Pro Tips Latte. Um, you know, as we discussed, you know, many of you know me as SSB Pro Tips, but in my experience at Smash, I have not been that for the majority of my time. So a uh, short story is I got into the competitive scene when Brawl released in 2008. 
how my first tournament was fast one. And um, basically uh, for a large percentage of uh, Brawl's lifespan, I was ranked second in Florida. So um, I really, you know, went into Smash kind of as a student of the game. And, you know, I really, um, I lived in a region that was um, incredibly weak at the time. Uh, South Florida was where all of the concentrations of good players were, you know, um, Lamb Chops. Um, you may know him as Beer Man, if you follow Melee. Um, he sort of taught the original generation of South Florida players. Then um, Orlando had Atronut, GDX. They had um, you know an established scene of people that came over from Melee. Tampa didn't have that. So in my case, I had to learn the game by studying video footage. So whenever like you know, back in the day, people were really secretive about their tech. But you know, whenever like someone would upload like a Mutual King video, like I was on it and like. <laughs> <laughs> no, believe me, like there's, I was notorious for leaving comments on videos because I would comment on everything I watched. So people would like know me for like, oh, I saw you comment on like this video. That's how I knew you saw it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, like I really spent like hours and hours analyzing like the videos of top players and my own footage. And you kind of practice by like, you, you, play, you play, you record your footage, you watch your footage, you watch the top players footage, you kind of like bridge the gaps between your own gameplay and the top players footage. And that was kind of how I came to like, see, I guess, decision-making the way I do. And um, I think that's probably the most heavy thing that influenced uh, my ability to, I guess, articulate what I'm seeing when, um, when I'm breaking down a clip. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think this, speaking about bridging the gap, I think this definitely plays into your, uh, your tagline, which is kind of bridging the gap between good play and top plays. So mm. how did you, get into that how was that mission created and what was your motivation behind that yes okay so it actually goes back to brawl and um as i talked about you know i came from a region that had no reputable players so um i had to i mean this is something that i you know plan to tackle on but i had to in a literal sense build my region from scratch you know um tying together you know tos you know um local players people who wanted to compete and we basically built like a very tight-knit smash scene you know out of like thin air basically so Originally, I was kind of the only threat from Tampa, you know, I was the only person like north of like South Florida besides Atronaut who could beat the South Florida ranked players. And eventually, you know, we had we had new players that joined us like um, Purple Guy, like uh, the Zelda player, you know, um, me and him actually he used to pick me up from school before band practice and take me to play and trade to like play brawl for like an hour and a half before dropping me off at my high school. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and then we ended up going to college together. So between classes, you know, I'd go over to his house and then like eventually as we gained more members, like um uh people would just like, you know, his house would be the spot. We'd all go over there and practice. And um we started carpooling together on Saturday. So, you know, two tourneys a month, we would all just wake up early on a Saturday and I didn't have a car until I was like, I don't know, like twenty two or something. Not twenty two, but like some like, you know, like later year. And um we would just coordinate together and um uh building the scene, I think um and uh, a lot of building the scene for me was kind of trying to like tap people into like the things I knew about Smash. And I think that's sort of where I got the experience, like seeing that area where it's like a lot of people reach this level easily, but there's like this like glass ceiling that a lot of people can't get past. Breaking that like ceiling for people was kind of where I got the experience. Right. And so you can kind of look at, look at us like the other side of the coin. We're trying to break that break that uh that ceiling but in terms of the psychological and mentality parts of the mm -hmm. game okay yeah and um something that's really important something that's kind of been like uh pulling at my mind is what kind of gap is this i know you described it as like a glass ceiling uh mm -hmm. the way that i the way that i'm looking at it is that it's either a chasm in which that it's this thing that's extremely difficult to get across and requires mm -hmm. like a huge leap of faith or it's a mountain where it takes like a lot of like generic linear progression to get there that's a great question actually i yeah. really like that question and um personally i would describe it definitely much more as a mountain like um i like to think of uh this way and um, i do have like a lot of content that i'm working on you know i obviously haven't been active but um, i have a lot of things that will i guess maybe give a more elaborate answers but a lot of um skill there's kind of like the more fundamental rock paper scissors game and i think some people come into Smash with that base already from just having played Smash as kids, and some people don't. But um, once you have that, a lot of the skill turns into like tacking on just like individual situations. And the pro tips are pretty much like focused on those individual situations where it's like, there's just little situations where most people tend to react this way. Or if people, if you do this, most people will do this. And like, you kind of explain the logic behind it. So it's like, 
it's almost like the skill on top of skill, which is the reason some people like Mutual King just seem like so like unbelievably consistent, even though like there are lots of other people that look like about the same speed as Mutual King, about the same level of like combos. Like I guess in Melee, like, you know, you guys haven't watched him play Brawl, but I think it's just like that extra level of just like knowledge and situations that you add like this situation, this situation, and suddenly like those situations kind of form a web and that web is kind of like the mountain. Hmm. Okay, so it's more for you just tacking on, in, in, almost like a, a Boy Scout collecting badges, like getting a kind really... of yeah. <laughs> That's actually not a joke. That's not a bad analogy. Yeah, at no, all. no, sure. Just collecting, uh, you know, collecting deep knowledge of as many situations as possible, and kind of stitching it all together into the player that you are. Yeah, and I think you know when I talk about fundamentals, the truth is a lot of fundamentals. It's actually just a combination of like that knowledge, and it kind of like creates the logic behind fundamentals. It's like, once you know this, it just makes more sense to like move this way in this situation or move this way in this situation or like things like stage control and like when it's good to commit versus not committing. It's like a lot of that is just sort of actually built out of the micro situations, but I would just call like certain things fundamentals, even though there's really like a smaller like situation, I guess you could pull out of it. Sure thing. So to me, it sounds like the way that you, the, the way that you view the game is that the difference between like good players and top players is that top players just seem to be more prepared at every level for more situations than than good players. Now, beyond yeah. that, beyond that, can you condense the difference between like, any yeah, other differences okay. between good and top players? Um. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I guess, one way for me to explain it. Because I mean, the gap is definitely it's definitely a knowledge gap. But explaining like what that means is like break it, explain it in terms of situations. I think makes more sense. It's like. Uh, for example, like, um, a lot of it has to do with the way you approach the game. And that's like kind of the other side of the corner I want to talk about. Cause I think a lot of people come into the game brand new and learn way faster than like people have been playing for a long time. And I think a lot of people who've been playing for a long time, they tend to, you know, fall into like, they have like habits and things they're comfortable doing. And then there's things that you can do that they choose not to do because they feel like they're game plan is good enough already. It's almost like rock, paper, scissors, but you have like more than rock, paper, scissors, but you can win the game with just rock, paper, and scissors. Some people don't branch out far enough as far as like different ways to handle situations. And when I talked about like um, like situations earlier, it's like there could be like the same situation and there could be like three different punishes, but then like in like 40 out of 50 times, one is the best option, but then like maybe at kill percent, the other one's the best option. Or like in one situation where you get punished super hard, one option is better, but another option, um, another situation where you don't get punished as hard, the riskier option is better. And it's like, that kind of knowledge is like, you're literally just tacking on like this situation, this situation, but one situation is like, it's against Sheik, but then the same situation happens, but it's against DK. And I guess like that kind of logic is like, if I just look at them as, oh, it's just a different situation, then it's just knowledge. It's just knowing more stuff. Right. Yeah, one thing that I, one analogy that I really like is that when, when your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. actually a really, really apt quote. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's probably one of the, one thing that I also see a lot in, in kind of the mid-low level play. Like people are like, uh, people see something work, but then you don't really understand why it worked. And that and that understanding of why something worked or why it didn't work, I think, uh, is is really important. Um, something that I want to get into, and something that you've expressed on your Twitter mm -hmm. before, is this idea of horizontal expansion of skills. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's something that's really interesting, especially going into ultimate and preparing for the next game. I want you to kind of talk us through what it means to expand horizontally and how this can be done in the best way possible. Yeah, well, that actually, um, it's really great that you mentioned that now because it kind of like, you know, segues right off, off of what we're just talking about as far as like situation. So I talked about um, uh, the Sheik situation versus the DK situation. So there's a lot of um, matchups where um, risk reward varies a lot depending on who you're fighting. So it's like against one character or something, it's safe. Against another character, something is not safe. So I'll use ZSS as an example because um, ZSS grab, you know, you get like huge reward obviously there's high risk. So there's a lot of situations where you you could grab someone, they're on the ground and you think you have the pressure for them to shield long enough for you to grab them, but you don't know that. So a lot of situations, depending on how hard you get punished for missing the grab, you might pick to do something else. Like for example, like um, 
ZS is a lot of like low risk, low reward moves, like jab, forward tilt, like up tilt is a little more high risk. But like her forward tilt is a great example because there's lots of situations where someone like Nairo, you'll see them just forward tilt in a situation where, yeah, maybe you could have like, maybe you could have grabbed or maybe you could have done something else. But as a result of like making sure that he wins the match in the end, he picks the safer decision and will wait for save the grab for a situation where he's more like reactionarily sure that he's going to get the grab. Right. So a, a low level ZSS player is going to see the powerful grab into the upper combo and they're going to be like, oh yeah, that's how I win the game. And like, they're going to see forward tilt, they're going to say, oh, this is a useless move. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and, a, and a lot of like a lot a really easy way to like um uh understand where someone is with this is when people start calling moves useless because there are not a lot of useless moves in smash and i mean that like wholeheartedly like if someone calls Politana's neutral be useless they're making a mistake like it's not a useless move it's her only projectile and if you have a projectile that will make some people approach in some situations you have a move that is not useless yeah. Like, same have you was... ever have you ever used Captain Falcon's neutral B? Okay, that move is trash. That move is not useless though. It is absolutely there. There are situations where Captain Falcon's neutral B will punish someone harder than the other options you can use. Like for example, um, a lot of those um, uh, the the way they jump up and they fall with the air dodge and do the reverse neutral B. The problem is it's really hard. I'm not trying to say that it's like easy to do, and I'm I'm sure you can definitely do something else. But the reverse Falcon punch is still stronger than a forward smash, or stronger than like any other move you would hit them with. It's not that it's easy to use, and it's not that I would say use that in tournament, but it's definitely not useless because it fills a niche that no other move has, the Falcon does. Nah, yeah, you're, only right, useless. you're right. Yeah, if there's a move that like does everything your move does, but better, then the other move is useless. But that all that almost never happens. Yeah, definitely. I think I think it's pretty interesting to think about how like even stuff like just like canceling charging with like Sheik's needle is like really useful mm -hmm. in terms of conditioning and, and oh it's great and, and it's like and there's all of these things that and just opening your mind and expanding your 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 smash consciousness with, with all of these mm -hmm. with all with all, with all of these things that is really is really testament to how strong like these top players are in terms of understanding absolutely like all of these variables that that go into that they go into their character and really appreciating like all of the things that their character and their opponent's character can do which is which is really important uh i think we, we can like transition here into uh in into tips and on and kind of improving at the game hmm. and how we help people improve at the game i think one okay. thing one thing that i see is that there will be great resources in the community like you who provide tips and provide exp uh, and provide explanations for for uh things in the game for situations and for fundamental things that we should be incorporating how does one go about incorporating these tips efficiently okay so um i guess i would have like a larger like guide on just how to learn smash in general but um i think a lot of like a uh, smash is like you set up like you set up like the formula and the base of like how and why you're going to learn the game and then like you sort of add the things on so it's like it's weird the pro tips is a kind of a weird series because i don't know where someone is starting when they see the tip and i think some people depending on where they are you know obviously the tip will be like more digestible or make more sense or you know be easier to add to their game right. but um uh i guess starting with a general question like that it's like i think you want to get to the point where you know you're consistently playing the game, you're consistently entering tournaments, you're consistently studying footage of footage of top players and following the meta game in general. You're consistently watching videos of your own footage and resetting your own footage. And if you have, I guess, throw those three pillars to begin with, things like the the tips will slowly tie into everything else you're doing. So it's like uh, you'll see one tip and it'll tie into a situation that happened last night while you're playing, or it'll tie into a situation you saw on stream last week. Or you'll be watching a replay and you'll realize, oh yeah, that was a situation where that tip probably would have worked. So I think a lot of it's about how you're already approaching the game. And when you're doing that correctly, the way tips, the tips should come pretty naturally. Okay, so you're saying like if your gameplay is a cake, right? The the, the, mm -hmm. the pro tip series is not the flour and the eggs, but rather it's like yes. the sprinkles on top. It's the it little... is absolutely the sprinkles on top. Okay, I, I like that. I like that. That, make, that makes sense. And it's nice it's nice to have a, a a firm foundation with which to contextualize the tips you know yeah um, definitely definitely 
Well, you did mention um, a a large guide, like how to learn Smash in general. And I know that you recently, uh, you know, worked on uh, accomplishing that feat of making that sort of guide. Um, mm-hmm. How how do you, I guess, take a big guide and break it down? How do you look at information, contextualize it, incorporate it into your own play, regardless of what level you're at? Okay, well, the truth is the guide I posted on Twitter is actually like a baby gu- guide I'm working on. <laughs> the version I'm working on is actually on a video. It's probably going to be like, I believe, like a six or seven part series. And um, a lot of it's written already, but I just want to make sure it's like digestible. Because, you know, like YouTube is weird. It's like sometimes you work really hard on something and you post it and it doesn't get any views. Then you post like a fart video and like it gets like a million <laughs> views. <laughs> So I just, I don't want to release something that isn't going to be high quality enough to, you know, like capture people. And that's kind of why I had been, you know, so ghost. Um, but uh, you want to ask like how I got to the point that um, I'm able to, I feel like I'm able to explain that kind of thing or. Well, well, well okay. Two, two questions. How, how do you articulate, you know, cause you, I think your big thing is not only do you see the game well, but you, mm-hmm. you communicate it cl- clearly. So how do you talk about the game? clearly and also if you're on the recipient end if you're trying to learn something how do you best utilize the information out there okay well in my case okay talking about the game um it's two things uh, one it's a lot of trial and error <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've actually been teaching people you know since um the brawl era um, it was actually um a lot of the uh players that um played in the brawl era were people i took under my wing there's unfortunately most of my like children you know my children of smash quit the game um, I would consider Manny to be like one of those generation players, though I didn't teach him as much as I taught like the other people. But um, yeah, it's like um, a lot of like uh, analogy. So a lot of it's like you try to explain like it in a uh, literal terms. Then like, if I think finding analogies for most people tends to work better if you can find like a parallel in either life or in like an anime you watched or something like that. <laughs> Often, I know, seriously, no, no, I wish you. Like, <laughs> yeah, they really do, you know, make sense when you, explain in terms of something that happened in a show or something. So a lot of it was just like really, you know, trial and error. And um, I happen to have, you know, teaching experience and I worked as a tutor for like um, a year, you know, when I was in college. So um, I think it's just like kind of like a combination of, you know, that, like, I guess, decent people skills, like, you know, you have to work hard not to, you know, step on people's toes and stuff when you're trying to teach them something. So you want to make the language as not condescending as possible. And like, I think it was just kind of a combination of those things why Pro Tips uh, was pretty successful. Yeah, definitely. I, I think like especially when you're like at the gym and someone asks you for your <laughs> someone asks you for a tip, you have to you have to be very careful with the uh, with yeah, that. You know? <laughs> yeah, you have, I think that's really important. That's that's something that a lot of people actually don't talk about in terms of uh sharing knowledge with people. Just the communication medium is so important. Yeah, well that's something we touch on a lot is like the whole intimacy of Smash, you know, because what you know the way that you play is really just a manifestation of your thought process the way you handle the rock paper scissors aspect of the game uh, Mm -hmm. is is very uh vulnerable and it's very much a reflection of how you process and make decisions in general Mm -hmm. so when people critique that it's almost as if you know the person behind the stick sometimes you know it's absolutely a fact dude i mean (laughs) i've seen it you know well i've seen it for years you know it's it really is um and i feel the same way the truth is Oh, uh, whoops, my headphones. Like, yeah, the truth is it's like there are a lot of situations when like people become stubborn because like denying the decision they made was correct is almost like denying themselves. So people don't want to like take the introspective route and like look at like maybe the decision I made there was wasn't smart for this reason or was could have been better for this reason. And I think that's kind of hard. It's one of the reasons a lot of people like they don't watch their own footage. That's one of the big things I see a lot actually. Yeah, so we actually talked about that pretty recently, and something that I was talking about, especially with this introspection point, which is one of my absolute favorite things to to profess to people, is about <laughs> introspecting and really understanding yourself. I love I love that, yeah, and w- and yeah, and one thing that I recommend to people is when they're watching their own footage, it can be very difficult to see yourself lose, especially depending <laughs> <laughs> depending like on on what kind of a person you are. So one thing that I recommend to people is that they watch themselves as if they're watching someone else. No, I like that. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to, I, I talked about the disassociation of the ego and kind of removing yourself from, hmm. from, the, from the footage, removing yourself yes, from, is- from, from your defeat and from your victories, interestingly enough. 
I think that I, I think that it's it's just such a huge thing in terms of improving and and like you said, just not watching your footage is really really gimping yourself in terms of your progress. I actually have um maybe like a little bit of a different take on that. I think it's really interesting. That so um I don't know if this sure. makes me a masochist or like what it is, but um I found that when it comes to like um uh rewatching your footage, it's almost like um building up immunity to like the emotional trauma of losing. And like what happens is, you know, whenever you rewatch a match, you kind of relive the emotion of like what you were feeling at that time. Yeah. So you remember like places you're really scared, you'll feel that when you're rewatching it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And I found that like the more I watch the the footage, the more I can turn that like I can turn off that like emotional response, the panic response. And it's like the same way, like, you know, like snake, snake, um, snake wranglers that like, you know, take a little bit of like venom, like once a week or something. And eventually they build up like their antibodies build up enough immunity that they can take like a rattlesnake bite and they'll be okay. It's almost like the same thing where you're like emotionally like hardening yourself and so that you become a strong competitor. And I think like, that's kind of what happens with any experience where like your first time on stage, you know, you're shaking or whatever. And then like second time you play on stage, like you're shaking a little less. And then like people like to buzz, like the entire venue is just trash talking them. And it's just like, oh, whatever. I'm still going to beat you. I'm still going to play the most. <laughs> Dude, I love that. I love that so much. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely, I definitely don't have the level. For example, I don't, I don't travel often. So like, even when I'm like on a big stream, you know, I feel the pressure, but I know people that are in a national every other weekend, they, they're not going to feel the pressure when they're on stage. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, uh that that's an awesome point and i think that's a good cap off to that portion of it and i want to hmm. i want to talk about um you know going back to you know you as the resource of 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 tips um mm -hmm. obviously it's awesome to get the information straight from the horse's mouth right and it's it's mm -hmm. awesome to have you as a resource in the scene but how would you advise that people kind of do what you do by themselves? You know, there's the expression, uh, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you know, you feed him for a lifetime. So how would you suggest you would uh, teach a man to fish? How do you tell people to do what you do for themselves without anyone else's help? Well, I think a lot of it is like, you kind of have to walk like the warrior journey before you retire to the show, you know, if that makes wait, sense. Wait, sorry, sorry, say that again, Lada, you cut out. Oh yeah, I think you kind of have to walk the warrior's journey first, become you retired before you retire retire to the dojo. You know, it's <laughs> like <laughs> it's like I wouldn't I wouldn't advise someone to like look to become like a commentator or look to become like an authority on Smash without first like being the player, like seeing the ups and downs. Cause I think part of the reason like people look at people like Scar in Melee and then Yipes in Marvel, the reason they're such good commentators is because they can relate so much to the experience, not just the thought process of the players, but the experience of the players. So like the emotional highs and lows, like they, they can say like with confidence and commentary, like that situation was really scary for him. Cause I know that situation is scary because I've been there or like, cause I've seen what happens in that situation. So I think a lot of um, the best commentators, if you look at like, um, and while I don't want to throw shade at any commentators, cause I do have a lot to say about that. But I think a lot of the most popular commentators are people that played Brawl for the entire lifespan. They, they got their, you know, whether they, you know, were ranked or not, they got their PR win every now and then. They got hyped. They got playoffs. They also got destroyed sometimes. They all sat down and played Mewtwo King for eight hours at someone's random house one night. Like, they all got to experience that. And so they're all kind of, like, on the same level of, like, understanding of the game. And I think after having been a competitor for that long period of time, like, you reach like an understanding where you're kind of like looking down on the scene. Like you're, it's like you're in the sky looking down at everything and you kind of see the whole big picture. So I think a lot of it's like, after you've really seen everything, that's kind of, I think where that comes from. Interesting. So, so let's just say that you weren't part of this generation. You were kind of like, aside from this, or you came in, or you were like the documentary kid version of Smash 4. Like, like you saw, like hmm. maybe you like saw- Oh, I see. Yeah, maybe you saw zero, like like zero success, and you jumped in. And uh, how how would you suggest that that you kind of that that you that you kind of like teach like teach people to fish, without having, without having built all all of this all all of this like experience from the past? Obviously, people are always looking for like really fast answers and really and really quick ah, solutions to everything. But we know that's not the case. We know that quick solutions don't work. 
but how do we teach people the path like you said the warrior's path how do we teach people the discipline yes awesome question i mean you guys are really on it by the way i have to say because like the i think the transitions have kind of lined up perfectly with like the stuff i would have wanted to explain anyway so that's really <laughs> perfect yes yeah, so um a lot of the warrior's path and i guess a lot of um your journey to becoming someone who like understands the game or understands competition or understands the scene it's about the mentality with which you walk through competition itself and i think this is really difficult because a lot of people in smash 4 didn't get to experience the scene the way i did um you know back in the day when there was no esports when it was all grassroots we really did experience the game like very much like a warrior's path where it's like you just kind of like you know you and your boys travel to a tournament you know two hours away and like your boys fight their boys and your boys are cheering for you and their boys are cheering for them. And then like you get hyped and then like next week and like eventually there's a regional and then like out of state comes and then like the guys you competed against before, now they're your friends and you're cheering for them. And it's like, there was this kind of like real anime kind of way that the your relationship with the competition built. <laughs> and as long as you felt like I want to be better than I was yesterday or I want to keep improving, I want to be the best someday. There was nothing interfering with that. But now we have the internet, we have esports. And right. it's kind of like commercialized, like McDonald's is the McDonald's McDonaldization. I don't, I don't know exactly how you say it, yeah, but that's kind of, like, yeah. So the way people would see the scene coming in now, it's more legends. Like you come in and you're like, dang, Ferguson's so good, man. I'll never be good enough to be on, you know, TSM or like whatever. But it's like back in the day, it wasn't like that. Like back in the day you went to a tournament. And just Mewtwo King was just there, you know, like Mewtwo is like, oh, Mewtwo King's going to be in Florida this week. You know, that, that's how it was. It wasn't like, there wasn't this esports like identity, like um, everyone's behind a wall now because of the amount of like noise, if that makes sense. Mm, that That's interesting. So how do we recreate this, this like old, like beautiful time? And how do we kind of, <laughs> how do we create, how do we? like train our minds to say, to like break these walls and to say like this and and, and to, to basically say that nothing is Im, no, nothing is impossible it's just all about our, our our own personal journey then well i think um two of the big things that um you know i'm also working on videos one is community and the other one is mentality so a lot of um the contemporary like you know smash world people play online they don't necessarily build like close-knit communities that travel to other regions and stuff. It's like, for example, in my region, Tampa, like in Brawl, there were no Tampa tournaments. Now in Tampa, there are six tournaments a week. You could wow. easily attend like four tournaments a week, a week and never leave the region. But the, you don't really build the same experience of like competing with people, traveling with people, building rivalries as much as you would have back in the day. And I think that's part of what made Brawl so different. And melee is you know as well is so different. Yeah, I think that that whole phenomenon exists because we live in. I mean, you in Florida, us in California, we live mm -hmm. close to some of the you know smash meccas. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like the people like in Ar like you know, in, in Kansas or something, like still have that kind of experience. Even in our region, since we were so far away from the, or not, I mean, relatively, we were, we were far away from the SoCal weeklies. So we had like a lot of inner regional play and a lot of that same kind of like anime stuff. Like, you know, <laughs> they were saying like, you know, my boys versus your boys. And then all of a sudden it turns out, <laughs> turns out we're boys like Vegeta Goku. Kind exactly. Of thing. Like it really does. <laughs> it's great. That's awesome. Man. Well, so you talk a lot about how, how to succeed, you know, a lot of your tips are very positive in the sense that, Hey, this is what you can do to improve your play. But do you mm -hmm. have any opinions? Like, what are some of the common places that people fail? You know, how how do you help people um, to to not do bad things? You know what I mean? You always help people to do good things. How do you prevent people mm -hmm. from failing? Like, what what are pitfalls that people fall into? Yeah, so I think a lot of it, um, a lot of it is uh, a lot of that issue comes from mentality and the way you look at learning. So I always try to look at the the journey of um. Uh, you know, becoming a better player and like reaching your max potential rather than focusing on tangible results. So, you know, you don't focus as much on like what you place at this tournament rather than like, did I play better than I did last tournament or did I know more? Or is this a matchup that I need to work on more things for, for um, in? And then did I do better than I did last time? Like 
Um, as long as you focus on the journey of bettering yourself as a player, the results will come. And it's not that everyone like has the potential to be the best player ever, but I'm saying everyone can be the best player that can focus on being the best player that they can be. And I think if you frame things in that way, people kind of focus on the process of, you know, putting their nose down, putting their head in the books, focusing on improving their gameplay, learning the setups. And as long as, um, well, I shouldn't say as long as, once people realize there's a relationship between like focusing on the process instead of the results and actually getting better, I think that's when people realize like, oh snap, I'm really gonna go to work now and I'm really gonna start setting hard. So that's really what I try to focus on and telling people like, focus on the process, the results will come, like there will be, there will be upsets, there will be like hard days, there will be days you're not playing as well. But if you focus on the, the process itself, you will get better in the long run. There's a lot of, I love you, man, because I, 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 I swear to you, every week I'm always preaching about process-based goals and like, you know. it's it's really is the facts, man. Yeah, I feel like if we gave if we gave you a script, your response would be literally, literally <laughs> what you said. It's it's pretty it's pretty incredible. Uh, I think something another thing along with this along this path, something that we've talked about before is that journeys are often and life in general is an upward sloping trajectory. Something that's interesting is that we always notice the the falls or the or the spikes because but we can't eventually see this future, the fact that we're we are progressing in this upward trajectory, but we can't see it. We can't contextualize it because we view time. We can't we don't view time as a as a fourth dimension. We view it as yeah. now. Yeah, I know definitely. Something that's interesting and so and and a reason and one of the huge things that people fall into is this idea called burnout, something that we've talked mm -hmm. about uh, previously. I, and a lot of it, in my opinion, is due to the fact that we can't view time in this in this way. And we're obviously human. Mm -hmm. Time is is now for us. Uh, how do you suggest that people? How how do you, how do you tell people uh, the ways of dealing with burnout? How do you explain how to how to deal with like being very like disenfranchised with the game? Um, well, I would say um, a lot of it is to, first off, listen to yourself. Like, if you're tired, take a break. If you don't feel like playing, you know, stop playing for a while. If you don't want to main Falcon and you want to main, like, a worse character, main a worse character, you know? Like, you should really, like, listen to, you know, what you really want. And I think a lot of that, in my case, for example, like, um, there was a point, I think, around, like, earlier this year when I uh, was successful. And uh, Meta Knight is actually, you know, one of my favorite Nintendo characters ever like in brawl i happened to main meta knight for most of it and he happened to be the best character but you know that wasn't the reason i was playing him and after seeing like oh wow man meta knight might be broken again you know i decided to drop cloud and like and at the time i've been playing like cloud like bayonetta chic and i decided okay i'm just gonna go solo meta knight and i think the time i have had playing solo meta knight has been more enjoyable for me than any point where i was playing like another character that i enjoyed playing but didn't love as much as meta knight even though i dropped him for like I mean, to be fair, my, my Cloud and my Bayonet are probably still better than my Meta Knight, but I still enjoy playing Meta Knight more. So, you know, I just listen to what my heart tells me, and I've had really good success with them because of that. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really interesting point in terms of, like, downgrading, but not really, because you because because the most important thing is just the enjoyment of the game. And if that's what keeps you going, and if that's what keeps you on the trajectory... Yeah, yeah if that'll yeah. Like, keep you practicing, then that's what matters more, you know? Exactly. Playing a crappy character, then you should play your crap, crappy character. <laughs> that is so important. That is really incredible. I think that's something that we actually have uh, haven't haven't really reached that 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 point in the show yet. And I think that's really cool yeah. that that you explained that you just kind of have to be. You have to understand the struggle. You have to understand the internal, the 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 internal mechanics of your mind. And once you've mm -hmm. really really figured out why you're why why you're doing things, it's it's really it's really important to. To just go with that and just and believe in and believe, believe in your your own mind. Uh, I, I actually I, wanted to touch on one quick thing, by the way, if you don't sure. mind. Before I go, go for um, it. Yeah, just going back to um, burnout. I wanted to tie that into horizontal expansion a little bit because I think a lot of like it's like the mystery of like horizontal expansion is that people run out of things they think they can learn. Basically, they like they can't think of things to add to their game. Basically. And I think because in Smash 4, win conditions are often very linear. It's like when you play like DK or Meta Knight, your win condition is like you get the combo that kills, basically. You get them to the percent, you get the combo, it kills. So often like um, I talked about with Nairo and the ZSS, like getting the grabs. The 
a lot of horizontal expansion is like, what do you do in the situations where you're not sure if the grab will work and less like having like more variety for those situations or like, or another example, what do you do when the thing that you normally win with doesn't work? Like maybe you ledge trump to kill, but you're fighting a character like Ryu who you can't really ledge trump or usually like um, ladder combo people, but your opponent's SDIing really well. And I think a lot of horizontal expansion is like, there's other ways like Bayonet is four smash is great. You can kill with that. But like a lot of like mid to like high level Bayonetas, they're not using Bayonet as forward smash just because she has other options that are so much more obviously better. So as far as like um, when people get stuck, I think a lot of it's like the horizontal expansion is literally like finding those other kind of ways to play the situations. I'm not sure if that exactly ties into the burnout thing, but I just kind of wanted to sneak it in. No, absolutely. I think that's huge in terms of the fact that people hit these plateaus. And when you hit these plateaus, because you're because yeah, your mind hasn't expanded to appreciate other ways of playing your character, other ways of closing out stocks. Yeah, then absolutely. You, yeah, you get you get stuck. I, I actually definitely went through that. I as a, uh, me as a DK main. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I I actually hit that point. I mean, it's really funny. Like the very the first three or four tournaments, I had a lot of success just using Ding Dong, <laughs> like, just, just 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 using the DK. Yeah, like I, I was. Fun. Exactly. Like I, and then I, it took me a really, really long time to appreciate like stuff like uh, jab pivot up tilt, which mm. is one, yeah, which is one of the the best ways to kill floaty characters or to kill yeah, yeah or, or or to kill people once they're past like one hundred and twenty percent. So I definitely feel that. Um, I think one thing which is kind of the harder part to to accept as as tutors and as mentors in the community is the fact that there's this really tiny group at the top. There's mm. the top is not is is very clearly separated from everyone else and we've seen and and we do we see a future in which the skill distribution becomes more even because as as people that want to teach people this game we want to see this future happen. We want to see this linear path. We want to like see this mountain that you described and kind of show people the warrior's path. Uh, do we see a future in 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 ultimate and in in the esports environment with the dissolution of some of the grassroots experiences, like you explained? Do we see a future in which this skill distribution becomes more even? Um, I'll my honest answer is probably a little bit disappointing, and um, I think it's no. And I think part of the reason is um the warrior's path is like um it's contingent on a couple things. Uh, you know, one of those I talked about was mentality, obviously. And um, then there's like more tangible physical things like, um, are, do you have the free time? You know what I mean? Do you have the free time to travel? Do you have the resources? You know, there are a lot of really good players who are kind of just trapped in a region somewhere where they don't get exposure or don't get to practice with higher level people that can push to the next level. And those people, you know, don't get me wrong, in 2018, we have more resources than ever. You know, we have like decent Wi Fi connections, we have Discord, et cetera. But um, for people to really be able to mechanically gain like, the kind of like knowledge of situations that someone like Zero or Mujiking does, they have to travel. And um, if you look at Mujiking, like in Brawl, he was the only person kind of self-sufficient off that game. He was in a different city like every every month, you know, that was like kind of his thing. And um, that level of like player experience where you've played just so many different kinds of people in like so many kind of different situations, like you really are just building an encyclopedia, like a library of stuff. And I think while the win conditions, the win conditions in Smash 4 are simple. So the knowledge Mutriking has, not all of it applies, but like, if you took that same level of like, oh, I guess zero, let's use zero as an example if you play Smash 4. Like the level of um, knowledge that he has, he has a lot of things that are like useful, but aren't the best option in Smash 4, but will be the op best option somewhere, again, some person somewhere. And lots of people will reach like the level of a top player without ever like breaching that amount of knowledge. Like, I think I, I know a lot of things that don't help me in my results. Like, for example, I know a lot of things that Meta Knight doesn't use. You know, like I, if I was playing Sheik or if I was playing Cloud, I would use those things. But that extra um, knowledge is not necessarily what takes someone to top level. But the people who are just on like this whole nother level, it's usually because they know just that much more. So someone like Zero, becoming as good as someone like Zero, I think, um, even if you were to master Smash 4's mechanics, you would still be missing a lot of things that Zero has. Right. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, especially in a game like Ultimate, where there's going to be so many different characters, and that library is going to be so much bigger. 
It's mm-hmm. almost going to be more limited or uh, limiting uh, when it comes to the amount of few players that can really have a library of knowledge on every single situation, right? There's going to be way more situations. Yeah, and um, but this um, someone that also has like a melee back. I actually played um, I played melee from um, say 2009, 2013, and um, I had some pretty good success in melee as well. Um, but the short story is um, not to, like to to my horn. The short story is I think when you look at like that horizontal expansion, like there's going to be things that like melee players are going to come into this game just intuitively doing that Smash Four players are going to have to realize like, oh, I didn't realize the mechanics were going to let me do that, and I think that's going to kind of like widen the horizontal and the vertical kind of gap by a lot in my opinion sure yeah i I guess to give another example it's like in brawl brawl was a game where people walked a lot in smash 4 you didn't have to walk as much but you notice like when brawl play they walk a lot so it's like someone that plays melee doesn't walk at all so like when you come into like smash ultimate where like you know the dashes are more powerful but some characters like sheik or meta knight who have really good walks they might still walk so like a melee player coming and fighting like a chic player who's walking might be like, you know, might throw them off versus like a brawl player. I guess that's that's kind of like a weird example, but I'm just trying to say that I think the mechanics of ultimate is gonna make this the skill gap a little bit bigger just because there's so much more variety. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And uh, thanks for the candid perspective. I I, I appreciate that you <laughs> that you approach it that way. Because I, I yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean I guess you know it's definitely not like it's definitely not like it's not the utopian answer or anything, but um, the good thing is that there obviously will be you know, far more resources, and the metagame will develop a lot faster as a result of there being more people. So that is really exciting because you know a lot of um, brought, look at the speed at which Melee's metagame developed. You know, look, yeah, like 2007 gameplay versus like 2015. We definitely could, you know, people could learn this game quickly. I I don't want to say that. I'm the NL be all. Just I know there's going to be more to learn, but there will also be more information. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there is going to be this this beautiful period at the beginning when there's not as much information. Where I think we yeah, are. that's when it's fun before the, yeah. the BS comes out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's it. Like so, I guess we'll get to appreciate it, appreciate that at the very beginning. And uh, thanks, thanks for wrapping that up pretty well. Uh, I think that yeah. yeah, I think that we have. That, that we are going to experience something very similar and it is good to understand and to appreciate the fact that this there there are these huge gaps in terms of how much you're like absorbing the game and how and how much knowledge you have about all of these situations so I, I think that's that's really good that you broke it down that way oh well, thank you thank you well lot of hey thank you so much for your time today man it was nice to to get all that insight I should tell you that oh. because of your appearance on the show, you've made it to the Beyond the Metagame Hall of Fame on our website. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yo, that is really awesome. I it's really do. It's an esteemed honor. You're next to J Tails, G Pick, and uh, <laughs> Balake, who who won our giveaway. So, <laughs> oh, very cool, very cool. J Tails is another OG Smash Generation. We're... Yep. Yeah, he's all actually... on the same stuff. So, love the guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. He, he he lives right next to us now, so we we see him quite a bit, and he's a He's a great player. Great guy. But Ooh, cool. Hey, Lottie, thank you so much for, for coming on. Where can people find you and uh hear more from you? I mean, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, um, feel free to follow me on S Oh leave us just twitter.com slash S Pro Tips. Otherwise, Lotta, you cut out my friend. Say it one more time. Oh yeah, I mean I would say just feel free to follow me on S Tips um if you don't already, you know, the is just twitter.com slash SP Pro Tips. I also do have a YouTube channel where I will be intending to post a lot more Pro Tips content. So I would say like have faith, you know, I will get it up and running and I'm really excited for some of the stuff to drop. On the other hand, I also do have a personal Twitter. Uh, there's obviously a lot more hooligan, a lot more just like making jokes or talking about my own personal results in tournament, which you know I keep I try to keep as far away from Pro Tips as possible. But um well, dude, yeah, you know, um, what about plug that SoundCloud? Bro? Yeah, what about the SoundCloud? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you absolutely can follow me on SoundCloud. I believe it's uh, soundcloud.com refresh dash latte. And um, yeah, I remastered a lot of my stuff recently. You know, also yeah. feel free to check that out. If you're Yo, check out Evil Genius. That's my favorite. Also, <laughs> also, you guys came prepared, didn't you? Also, Goldman <laughs> Stacks. Goldman Stacks. <laughs> I was having it. a good time, man. When I, when I dropped that. Well, dude, it, it, it's sick, man. Yeah, check him out, bro. Give it a listen. And, uh, man, it's been a great time, Lottie. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.
Welcome back to Beyond the Metagame, guys. That was our interview with SSB Pro Tips. I thought that re really well, Avi. What do you think about that uh, you know, post-interview? I think it was really cool. He broke down a lot of stuff that we've kind of uh, at least somewhat talked about talked about before. We covered a lot of things in a really short amount of time. And explaining that the path to greatness is a long and arduous one that can't just be jumped to, I think is one of my favorite things to profess to people and is one of my and is one of my favorite things to talk about. So I'm glad we got to really flesh that out. Yeah, man, absolutely. And uh I, I just really enjoyed everything he had to say. It really seemed like his philosophy with the game really aligned with a lot of the stuff that we preach in our show. And uh, yeah. it, it's fun because, yeah, I mean, we had never uh, interacted with him before. And, um, you know, we can already tell that we got along great because I think we see a lot of the same things in the same way. You know, we have a lot in common. Yeah, it seemed like he, he like, felt that way, too, <laughs> in, in terms of, like, a lot of a lot of things lining up. And I'm glad that we're both doing doing things on our, on our like, uh, separate coasts, uh, on our respective coasts to improve the community and to strengthen the ties that we have to the Smash Bros community and to continue this uh this tradition of like grassroots uh improvement and a, a really really strong community with strong mentalities. Absolutely man. So I think we transition over to the Twitter questions. Don Quixote asks, uh how do you two deal with the people's expectations of your performance? Uh do you feel this affects your motivation and or love for the game for better or for worse? Uh Personally, I try not, obviously, I try not to think about other people's expectations of me because that will create lots of pressure for you, especially against players that people think you're supposed to win against. Uh, I, I don't really think about it that much, although it is a very, very common thing for people to be very hung up on what other people think of them. Uh, I think personally... I deal with it by just not thinking about it, which is a really, really uh, bad answer in terms of giving advice to someone <laughs> because you can't just say like, I just don't think about it. But um, I think if you, the way that you should handle this, and if I were to like tell someone how they should handle other people's expectations of them, uh, of, of their performance is either to set your bar higher than theirs or to understand and contextualize their their expectations of you and and re realize that people mess up sometimes especially in such a game like smash 4 understanding that the game is extremely volatile so just because their expectations didn't hold up in one scenario doesn't mean on average that their expectations were were weren't like completely out of base uh, i'd like to hear your thoughts on this too yeah. yeah yeah sure well i think uh there's two kinds of people maybe this is over generalization but a lot of people really love really love the pressure that expectations place on you and some people don't like it you know um and it isn't so binary but let's just oversimplify it for the sake of it i'm the kind of person that really thrives when pressure is placed on me so when people expect me to uh you know, to excel and to do well, I actually think it, it makes me play better because I want to live up to their expectations and I, I I try to find a way to do so. And it really pushes me, it motivates me. Um, but I want to contextualize it in this in this sense. You know, if people expect you to do well, it's probably because they like you. It's probably because they see something good in you. And when you do well, they feel validated in their initial beliefs. If you underperform, they because they were invested in you in the first place, they will very easily write it off. You know, they'll say, oh, you know, it's okay. He had a bad day today, but he'll, he'll do better next time. You know, it's okay. That's still, that's still my boy up there. He'll do great next time. You know, people are really, your supporters are really quick to forgive. And, um, you know, on the contrary, if you have haters that say, oh, this guy's going to do terrible. Um, if you do really well, you can shut them up. And if, uh, and if you mess up, they just kind of laugh, ha, and move on. But you know, it's, it, it's nothing that I think people really over over focus on on the importance of those expectations, but I think really they're they're quite fickle when it comes down to it. Yeah, interestingly enough, I think people also overestimate how much other people are thinking about them. <laughs> like I, I think it's really we have this idea that people are always thinking about us, that the mind is very self centered. When in reality people are likely only thinking about us for very like short ephemeral moments, which is which is really interesting, uh, really interesting concept. 
Um, I think we're going to go into our next question. Bacchus asks, what do you think the platform of the Switch will affect positively and negatively the modes of the game being online, offline, for tournaments, and what aspects or features of the game itself were you in the lens of running tournaments? Hmm. So as far as the features go, I think, I, I hope anyway, that like, if, for instance, in the 3DS versus the Wii U release of Smash 4, we saw a different uh, kind of gameplay philosophy. Because the 3DS version was mobile, we saw like Smash Run, which was a very pick-up-and-play, bite-sized, replayable bit of content, whereas Smash Tour was very more suited to the console on Wii U. It was sit down, play with friends all around to the same TV. And what I hope that that implies for the future is that because uh, the Switch is portable, it, we get a bite-sized kind of replayable game mode. That's my prediction. Of course, the Switch is a hybrid console, so um, you know it's hard to say for sure. What do you think, Abby? Uh, I think I think I agree with those points. And to answer some of the latter aspects of that question, uh, specifically as a former TO, what would worry me a lot about running tournaments is the security of switches at events. That's something that's that we're going to have to look out for uh, in terms of best practices in running events and making sure that everyone's consoles are secure. Like you said, with the portability and this hybrid console, people's uh, consoles are way less secure than they used to be, I think. Also, because the Wii U was not a good console, <laughs> I think this is not an unpopular opinion. Uh, the Wii U was a very underperformant console in, term, in terms of what it could do, what games it offered, and people didn't really steal Wii U's. Switch, the Switch, on the other hand, is a, is has already outsold the Wii U. Is has already like being like a lot of content has been developed for it, and it's an extremely successful console like so far. And people are going to be looking to uh, to to basically, unfortunately, capitalize on events like this. So I think that's probably what's going to worry me the most as as someone who looks through the TO lens. I think on the other side, it's we're going to get a lot more setups, I think, because of how portable it is. I'm really excited for that aspect because people are actually going to bring their setups more as long as they trust in the uh, in the infrastructure that we set up for them. Well, yeah, sure, man. Well, that, that's awesome. I think I think you just that perfectly. I don't really have anything else to add. Um, but, Avi, I, I, we've been talking about something in the works, and I want you to tell the people about it. Sure. So we have been setting up the community Discord. Uh, right now, we're kind of we're going to be testing it out. It's going to be invite only for the current uh, for the current time as we figure out what place that this Discord holds and what we what we can do with it. So we're going to kind of do like a beta trial run with it and have people come on our Discord, uh, share their knowledge, share their experiences. And we're going to kind of develop this so that we can turn it into this nice community hub for everyone to come to. And so just make sure to look out for invites in the future. If you want to, if, if you want an invite, definitely DM us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. Also, we'll be reaching out uh, to, to invite people to this, to this Discord. So just kind of keep your, uh, keep your eyes peeled. We will be releasing that very very soon yeah well you can find our show wherever you find podcasts that's ios that's uh on our website youtube spotify we're now on google play props to abby for setting that one up uh appreciate them but yeah um thank you guys so much for listening and until next time guys